if you've not been with us the last several weeks, let me uh, catch you up to speed real quick on where we've been. We're uh, presently in a series of sermons, lessons that are entitled Instinct. The idea of this comes from a rather unusual place, at least an unusual place for a sermon series. And it traces back to Charles Darwin's research and his famous book on the origin of species. In this book, he... Um, he outlines, he points out that, um, that, that as um, species evolve, the last step in evolution is a change of instinct. For something to truly be transformed, what has to finally take place is those, those very deep um, inner wirings, the, the, very, the very way in which our, our minds work and the way we interact with our outside world, those deep instincts change. And that's the final step of true and full transformation. Instincts are natural. Uh, instincts are what we do when we're not thinking about what we're doing. Uh, instincts are the things that, that come without, uh, without conscious thought. They're responses. They, they're actions. They just, they just happen automatically. And here in this fallen world, we see that um, every aspect of our, our world is fallen, including even our instincts. The instincts that you and I are working with and living under today in the natural sense of the human condition are not the ones that God intended. They're not the way God created us. In fact, he is in the business of transforming us, bringing us from what we were, what we are to, to what he wants us to be and ultimately what he always intended that we would be. And it's not just our words and our deeds and our actions, but it's, it's our motives it's our thoughts, it's our reflexes, it's our responses, it's our inner wiring, it's our instincts. So far, we've examined three of our inborn natural instincts that God changes within us as he transforms our hearts and minds. First, we examine the instinct that we have to, to save, to gather stuff up. And, and the more difficult the situation is, the more stuff we want to have, because if we can meet our needs, if we can pile up enough stuff, then we can be sure and we can have security. And this human instinct uh, of gathering up stuff, God speaks into that and he changes that from gathering up and saving and storing to being generous and sharing and demonstrating a higher calling of how to deal with the blessings that God's given us. Next, we looked at strong. Strong, to be independent, self-reliant. I'll do it myself. I don't need anybody else. I don't want anybody else's help. This is the picture of a person who, who, who absolutely feels that they can and will do it all on their own. And this is a natural instinct. But God calls us and changes us to something very different, a higher way of life, a, a way of community, of mutual benefit, of honesty, of courage, of integrity of having the ability to say, I need help, and accepting it from those that God puts in our life to help us. Last week, Bishop led us through a great lesson, a study of the word same, and the instinct that we have to always want to be with those who look and act and sound and, and are like us. The birds of a feather flock together instinct that we have is something that God breaks into and breaks us out of as he calls us from fear of others to love of others. And the idea that uh, no longer is same, uh, the thing that we should constantly be focused on, but embracing others and the diversity that it brings. Today, we're in the fourth lesson in our series, and it follows a predictable pattern. Once again, we're going to be looking at a word that starts with the letter S. And today, that word is the word sure. Sure. And the word sure is a word of confidence. It means that we know that we're right, we're correct, we're accurate, we've got it all together. And that is the challenge that we have before us of what does the human instinct of being sure really mean? Now, you've noticed to this point that all of our uh, particular topics have, have followed and revolved around this idea, and this idea being that uh, we want to feel safe. We want to feel safe, and the way we feel safe, or the way we think that we feel safe, is to be in control. We want to be in control of our world, control of our surroundings, control of our situation. And so most of our instincts revolve around this idea of, of gaining control so that we can feel safe. And one of the ways that our instincts drive us to do that is to, to feel sure. 
to know in our bones that we are absolutely right. Knowing that we're right makes us feel in control. It makes us feel like there's a, a clear picture of what our world is and what the, the truth of reality is around us. The other thing it does is it very easily helps us to distinguish between those who are right and those who are wrong. And this classification, this categorization leads us to a, a feeling of comfort. Our world is ordered. We understand it. We have it all figured out. We know everything about it. We know who's right. We know who's wrong. And we know exactly where we stand on all issues. And this is what we desire. This is that inborn natural human condition coming out of wanting to be in control. Now, the, the situation that we have to be attentive to is that the word sure, as we see it, as we have it defined for us this morning, is different than maybe the way we might use it in common usage. So, so hear me out. This is the way this instinctual sense of sure plays out in our life. And here's what it looks like. Sure has all the answers. Sure needs to learn nothing more. Sure has arrived. Sure isn't growing or stretching or challenging or, or, or learning. It's no longer curious. It's no longer asking questions. It's focused instead on identifying others as right and wrong and about defending itself in every possible situation. Social scientists call this condition stake, S-T-A-K-E, stake. And when we have stake in a position or an idea or a thought, it, it, um, it lends us a sense of value. We feel connected to others who share that stake, and we feel united against those who don't share that stake. This is something that we draw our security from. And, um, and typically, we find that these security drawing issues, these deep stake issues, revolve around two common themes. And they're the two things that your mom said never bring up at Thanksgiving dinner, religion and politics. These are two issues that just have, have a deep uh, sense uh, of who we are as people and what our values are and a well-defined sense of, of who's not with us and who's wrong and who's right. And everybody always knowing where they stand on all these kinds of things. Uh, one writer explains it in a very straightforward way. And he says, our instinct is to find agreement on these stake issues, these stake issues. And, and let's be honest, when it comes to politics, we do these kind of things. And when it comes to religion, we do these kind of things. The, 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 the chances are very good that the, the choices you and I make for what news we watch and read and consume have a lot to do with where we already stand, what our positions are. And we find sources that reaffirm and, and, and agree with what we're already believing. It's true about religion as well. We're not likely to, to attend or read or watch or, or listen to or, or try to learn from uh, somebody who has a different view of something in a religious sense than do we. And so when it comes to these security drawing topics, I want us to think about what happens when these topics are brought up. Because when one of these topics comes up, there's two things that can happen. Somebody can agree with us or somebody can disagree with us. Let's look first at what happens when someone disagrees with us. A hot topic comes up that you have a lot of stake in. Maybe it's religion, maybe it's politics, maybe it's something else that you feel very strongly about. And one of two things happen, and when you feel disagreement coming, the first thing that happens is that inside your brain, it fires this amygdala. The amygdala is the, the reptilian, very ancient part of your body. It's not a thinking part. It's a responding part. It's a reacting part. It's, a, it, it's the part that just immediately uh, senses danger and identifies that we must act to combat that danger, to somehow deal with that danger. And so what we get is a fight, a flight, or a flock kind of response. Uh, we fight. We're going to fight back. We're going to flush our body with all kinds of adrenaline so that we're ready for conflict. And we're angry and we have this passionate, burning warmth that flows through our body. Or we, we flight. We run from it. We, we got to get away. We can't, we can't be around this. Uh, or we flock. Let's gather together with people like us so that we can be protected in number. And you see, when it comes to a stake issue, this is exactly what we do. Because first thing often we do is fight. We feel ourselves tense up and our mind immediately begins building the arguments. And we begin to go through the process of how am I going to show them I'm right? How am I going to bring my argument to bear? Or we flight. I don't even want to be around this. I, I might somehow be, it might be contagious. I might catch these ideas. These are dangerous and my fear makes me run from an even being around this kind of an influence. Or, or third, we flock together. 
and we gather together for the point of, of judging and saying, you're not us, you're not like us, and, and I am with those who are like me, and, and this is where you need to be and where you would be if you were right. So disagreement happens, and when that happens, these are the responses. But the other side of the coin is also true. Sometimes people agree with us. And what's interesting is that that's equally as dangerous because agreement fires a different part of your body, a different part of your brain. This is the, the nucleus accumbens, and what this does is this is the, the control center for pleasure chemicals. This is it floods your body. It, it's, it's an amazing thing, this release of, of endorphins and these, these chemicals that come through that your, your body identifies as, as good. And when you hear agreement, it is actually literally firing your body up with pleasure. It's the exact same area that's affected by, by addictions. And it's one of the reasons why agreement is so deeply ingrained within us. We may not think about it, but what's happening when someone agrees with us, it is feeding an addiction. We are literally chemically, biochemically addicted to people agreeing with us. If you recognize that, you see that this is something that has a deeply ingrained thing. Interestingly, in our fallen state, Neither agreement or disagreement fires anything in our executive brain. It doesn't naturally happen that our logical, rational thinking brain is engaged. It's completely circumvented. It's completely circumnavigated. It goes right to these emotion centers. And that's where our brain, our instinct wants to take any kind of a stake, uh, security drawing topic. That's very interesting, but you know, I think you'd agree with me if you really give it some thought that this is a fallen and twisted sense of, of being sure. This isn't what God called us to do, where everything in our life is this reactionary fly off the handle or, uh, or, or be so uh, chemically dependent on everyone else's affirmation. There's something very dangerous going on here, and there's something very twisted about what this is. And into this mis. Uh, misapplied logic. And Christ steps boldly to rewire and to give us a new sense of instincts. See, our old instinctual pattern goes along the lines of, of we want to be sure because sure makes us feel comfortable and comfortable and, and in control means that we're right. And if we're right, then we automatically know who's wrong and we know that we're never wrong, but that other people always are. But what if we pursued a new pattern? What if we allowed Christ to change within us a new pattern that would bring us to a logical rather than an emotional kind of reactive pattern? What if it went more like this? We want to be sure. We want to be sure, but we recognize that sometimes we may have something wrong. And by recognizing that we may have something wrong, it opens our possibilities to a greater sense of being right and being even more sure. Because the possibility of growth, and the possibility of something we didn't know, the possibility of something yet to be discovered exists. This old human instinct of being sure has some terrible downsides. It closes us off to new learning. It keeps us from developing and having a growth mindset. It, it removes the possibility of fruitful maturity down the road. It hinders us from community because it's always causing us to, to fight or to flee or to isolate. And it's clearly opposed to any number of biblical principles. And let's just be honest. It just doesn't sound like Jesus. This is not the way we saw Jesus acting. And I think Jesus calls us to something greater, something better. So how do we reverse an instinct that's so deeply in, uh, engaged in us? Well, I think that the thing we have to recognize is that with man, this is impossible. This isn't something you and I can do. We're not going to think our way through this or create a 12-step process. But what we can do is we can invite Jesus Christ to come into us and change us the way that he tells us in Scripture. And he shows us through his life that he wants to see us grow to become more the people that we would uh, we are created to be. You know, the fact is, we're not the first generation to deal with this. God's people have a long, long history of being stuck and static and stubborn and resistant to any kind of change in the name of being sure. Let's look at an example of this. In John chapter 5, this uh, passage of Scripture, and I'll, I'll read this to you. This was something that, uh, that Jesus was, was tangling with the Pharisees, uh, almost more so than any other group. Uh, in fact, it is true, but more so than any other group, Jesus' most passionate and, and most um, uh, deep interactions of, of a hostile nature uh, had to do with the Pharisees. And once again, he's in a contention with the Pharisees. And, and here in this passage, um, 
39 through 47. Let me just read it to you and listen to some of the exchange that Jesus has. You pour over the scriptures because you think you have eternal life in them, and yet they testify about me. But you are not willing to come to me so that you may have life. I do not accept glory from people, but I know you, that you have no love for God within you. I have come in my Father's name, and yet you don't accept me. If someone else comes in his own name, you accept him. How can you believe? Since you accept glory from one another, but don't seek the glory that comes only from God. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, because he wrote about me. But if you don't believe what he wrote, how will you believe my words? You see, they were so sure of what they believed. They were so sure of the way they had constructed their world, the way that they had organized and categorized and, and clarified their thoughts, that they stubbornly refused to see the Savior who was standing right in front of them. The Messiah, the one that they read about, the one that they professed to be watching for and waiting for and yearning for, he was right in front of them. The one that they read about in their Bibles was in their midst and they missed it because they stubbornly refused to see that they could have misunderstood something. They were sure, but they were blind. And that's a dangerous place to be. Let's look at another example. In Matthew chapter 5, we again see this, uh, this same kind of picture going on. And this takes place in Jesus' most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. <coughs> and in this passage, um, he, he's, uh, he's talking about uh, this, this higher calling to which he is uh, drawing all men to himself and, and an understanding of how to view and see this world and our interaction with it in a much different light. But in this, he has a bookend kind of statement. In chapter 5 and again in chapter 7, he bookends this with a, a, an admonition, a, a criticism of these stubborn and closed-minded Pharisees. And he, this admonition in verse 15 through 20 uh, refers to this very aspect of the Pharisees who refuse to recognize a shortcoming in their own understanding. They refuse to be open to the reality that's presented to them because they are so sure of their own uh, conception of how reality is. In chapter 7, he brings that back around. And he, he shows how the people who are standing in their midst are marveling at Jesus because Jesus teaches differently than what they're used to. Jesus doesn't teach like the Pharisees do. See, Jesus challenged his audience to rethink what they knew. And Jesus time and time again brought before them what they were sure of. You have heard it said. You have been taught. You have believed this. But I say to you, he's introducing to them the possibility that there is something greater, something bigger, something grander than the small little world that they have created for themselves and that they continue to jam themselves and their faith down into. I wonder how oftentimes we too need to have that kind of um, breakthrough message in our lives. This is what you've been sure of. This is what you've been taught. This is what you thought. But that's not actually, Jesus would say, what I'm teaching you. Open your mind, open your heart to the reality that's being presented. The good news is that we do have examples of people in the life of Christ and through the time of the New Testament that were able to step outside of these preconceived notions, their own sureness and recognize the truth that Jesus was presenting. One of these examples is the man Saul. You know, if anybody was going to be open-minded to Jesus, you certainly wouldn't have thought it was going to be Saul, right? I mean, this is uh, one of the most hard-headed and hard-hearted of all the Pharisees that we have anywhere in Scripture. Uh, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Uh, uh, he was top shelf when it comes to the religious uh, elite. He was the very best that there was. If there was anybody who was ever sure of what they believed, it was Saul. Thinking back on those days, his early days, his Pharisee days, in Acts chapter 23, he said, you know, I've lived before God in good conscience my whole life. Everything I've ever done, I believed wholeheartedly that I was right. I was always sure. He said to the church in Galatia in the first chapter of his, uh, of his epistle to them, uh, you know of my former life in Judaism. You know I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. You know who I was, and you know how confident I was. You knew how sure I was. Saul figured it all out, or at least he thought he had it all figured out. And his life was one long string of fight, flight, 
flock and agreement addiction. Everything about what he believed was reaffirmed in his world through his twisted sense of being sure, this human instinct. But how grateful are we that, that, that he was able to consider new ideas, that Christ was able to create new neural pathways in his instincts so that when truth was presented to him, he was able to accept it. He was able to accept that voice from heaven that said to him, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He was able to turn his life over to Jesus Christ and allow Christ and the Spirit of God to move in him and to transform him from what he was to what he is and what he became. He allowed God to countermand all of that other instinct that was built up inside him. Saul's a great example of that and a picture of what we need to sometimes evaluate a possibility in our own lives of. But I'll share you another example and one of my favorite characters. He, he's not a Pharisee as far as we know. <clears throat> we have no reason to believe he was a Pharisee. And he's, he's a mysterious creature, a character in some ways. He's not somebody we know a lot about, but I love the character of Apollos. Uh, a man who had a, a command of scripture, who was a, an enormously gifted teacher and preacher. He just, he, he just held and captivated an audience and presented with such power, but he was incomplete in what he was sure of. Even though he was so confident in his message, he had not been taught to completion. He hadn't understood the whole thing. He was sure, but he needed correction. He needed completion of his message. And how graciously he accepted that. He didn't fight it. He didn't flee from it. He didn't flock away from it. But he embraced it and he allowed his heart to be open and receptive to the message that Priscilla and Aquila brought to him about the truth of salvation that's found in Jesus Christ. What if he had been too sure? What if Saul had been so stubborn in his confidence in what he knew to be sure, what he thought was sure? Well, look at all the books in the Bible we wouldn't have. Look at all the messages that would never have been preached. You see, sure, as a human instinct, is a lifeless, stagnant, closed-minded state of being. It's a fallen instinct. And we have passages all throughout the Bible that talk of, of what we should be in Christ, of being open and responsive and growing and learning. And here we can be truly sure because here we're confident not in our ability and our understanding and the way that we've ordered our world, but in what God is doing and working through us and the transformation that he's bringing about within us. Take, for example, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, where Paul talks about being renewed day by day. This isn't a static, lifeless, just stubborn refusal. This is a constant renewal that takes place day by day. He was presenting this message to the early Christians, and he was talking about a lifetime of growth, a continual walk, a journey that's taking place over the course of their entire lives, not something that you arrive at. In Hebrews chapter 4, where Apollos, <clears throat> Bishop, where Apollos tells us that the Bible is a living and active document. It's continually offering value to our ever-growing and ever-maturing walk. This is a process that's moving forward. And we can look at so many others, Ephesians 4, where it says, you must put on a new humanity which is being created is being created daily. Colossians chapter 1, Paul speaks of the renewing spirit that's constantly at work within him and the believers. In Thess 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, it says their faith was continually growing. This is the process. It's one that's moving forward. It's one that's continually embracing the fact that we're not stagnant, but we're experiencing a deeper and, and uh, more... Um, intense understanding and walk with Christ on a daily basis. So then what do we do with this? Uh, what do we do with this possibility that you and I have become calcified and we've become stubbornly resistant so the, to the point that maybe we're guilty of being in a position like Apollos where we don't have as complete a message. Maybe we're in a position where we're like Saul, where we're refusing to hear truth because it doesn't match what we have been taught and what we believe. Or maybe we just have passively fallen into this mentality that we have arrived and that we don't need to be learning. 
And into the face of that, Christ reminds us of words that we are renewed day by day, the humanity that's being created within us, the new creation that we are constantly being brought into uh, reality through the work of the Spirit in us. So let me give you today really quick three little things that I want to encourage you to think about and how you might be able to try to do this. And I recognize, first and foremost, this is not something you and I will do. With, with man, it is impossible, but everything's possible with God. We've already referred to that once, and we'll say it again here. This is impossible with God, but, but God the Father, who, who leads and directs, who plans and orchestrates our life, God the Son, who died for us and continues to, uh, to, to be our, our, our mediator before God, God the Spirit, who lives within us, uh, who, who works to transform us, these are bringing about the transformation. So what are some steps that we can take? How are some ways that we can try to examine this potential within our lives? Well, three suggestions I have. First of all, phone a friend. Phone a friend. Reach out to someone who, who believes differently than you do on some subjects. Reach out and talk to someone who differs with you on, on, on a, a stake issue. And really listen and hear where their perspective is coming from. You might gain a new insight. You might have a new idea. There might be something that, uh, that, that makes you think in a different way. There might be a rock in the path that's overturned. And there's, there's nothing that brings about more conscious thought than examining new ideas and listening, asking questions, and considering possibilities. Next, read something new. Let's all just go ahead and acknowledge that we tend to affirm what we already believe. In any issue that we're deeply committed to, we already know what we believe and we don't really want anything new to be uh, introduced into that because we're sure of it. But the fact is that it can be... Um, we can be missing some really important lessons. We could be missing some really important ideas to widen some of those influences and to try to see if there are things that we can learn outside of what we already know and outside we're already, we're already so sure of. Uh, it might help us very much to be able to, um, to broaden and find truth that to this point we've been blind to. Remember, the Pharisees were standing right in front of the Messiah and they professed to be watching for the Messiah. And yet, they were blind to what was right in front of them. They needed some new information. They need a new perspective. And maybe we can do that as well. Third thing, try humility. You know, when I think about the things that five years ago that I was sure of, that now I look at and I think, I, I can't believe I, that I believed that. I, I think about the things 10 years ago that I thought, I am so sure of this doctrinal belief. I'm so sure of this particular teaching. And now I look at it with embarrassment. There are things from college that I think are outright heresy. And, and, I, and I recognize that what I was sure of then is not what I profess to know now. And I would imagine that if you'll be honest with yourself, you're in a similar situation. You know, one way that we can really address these is by adding a, a, a dose of humility. What if I were wrong on this? Where can I be incomplete in my message? Where could I be stubborn and resistant? What is an issue, an idea, a thought that I might be pushing away that in actuality might be a thought that, that um, helps me to grow? How can I find in my own life a little dose of Saul or Apollos or the Pharisees? And where might I need to identify a weakness, a shortcoming? something that I'm wrong on, that I need to address. Three ideas that might be of help to you. But let me close by saying this. The old instinct is to be sure, to be resistant to new ideas, to, to be resistant to new information, to be stagnant in your learning, to be more focused on, on fighting against those who believe otherwise, running away from people who aren't like us, and flocking together in isolation with only those that are like us, or confirming this constant ongoing addiction that we have for affirmation by others. This is our old instinct. Uh, our old instinct is to be sure in, in my ability. I can read it. I can understand it. I can apply it. I can do it. The old instinct is to find security in, 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 in rituals and in practices and in, in what we know and what we believe and what we keep hold on. But the new instinct, I think, is to be renewed day by day to be constantly growing, to be consistently learning, to be daily striving for maturity and fruitfulness.
and into all of this remaining like the vine. You know, it's interesting. One of Jesus's last illustrations was just that, an illustration of the vine. The vine and how the vine's job is to remain attached to the branch. Jesus is the one through whom we get all the nutrients and all the nourishment and all the growth takes place through us. And yet that, that branch that grows and, and buds and produces leaves and produces fruit is constantly in a vibrant state of dynamic maturity. And it comes not because of the branch and what it's doing, but it comes because of the vine to whom it is attached. And we find that same kind of vibrancy and dynamic growth and maturity by remaining attached to Christ and open and receptive, responsive to what he's opening our hearts to. I hope that this week will be one that our hearts will remember that our, our confidence is not based on that of the Pharisees who were sure what they were right in their power, their control, their understanding, and their concept. But instead, our confidence is based on knowing who Jesus is, knowing the promised spirit that he would send to us. John 6, he says, I'm going to send you the spirit. He's going to guide you into all truth and allowing that to be the guiding force that brings us to a confident assurance of our state and our standing with him and our opportunity to make a difference in a fallen world.